It has long been debated whether the dragons of antiquity were real or merely allegorical. Unfortunately, most who aim to address this literal interpretation veer into the realm of fantasy and fiction without ever duly considering the animal kingdom and the laws of nature. Similarly, do the Darwinists err when they assume that these myths may have been inspired by the now extinct and largely fictional dinosaurs. As Occam's razor demands, there is a much simpler explanation to be had as to the consistent depiction of dragons around the world in ancient times. The reality is that dragons are alligators. This would include all crocodilians but primarily the alligator, and I will tell you why. While many are familiar with the alligators of the southeast United States, not many people are aware that the only other place on earth where the alligator exists is China. The Chinese alligator is a true alligator, differing very little from the American alligator, but greatly from the crocodiles of Asia. It is only the alligator which could have inspired the historical depictions of dragons, regardless of symbolism and allegory. Hearing such a statement for the first time, it is natural for one to retort with, what about the wings, or what about the fire breathing? These concerns, among others, will be more than satisfied and will serve to further pin down the identity of that reptile which did, in fact, inspire the universal dragon archetype. This assertion will be substantiated not only mythologically, but linguistically, geographically, astrotheologically, alchemically, and anatomically. I should also admit that I am not the first to postulate that dragons are alligators. It has long been recognized by the Chinese that their legendary Long, or Lung, was inspired by their own native alligator. An animal which is so critically endangered that less than 150 are believed to exist in the wild. So yes, we may have another panda situation on our hands. Although Florida is not as associated with the dragon as China, it is believed that alligators and crocodiles share a common ancestor in this state, for it is the only place on earth where they occur side by side in the wild. Let us now discuss the symbolism of the dragon and clear up some misconceptions about them, and in doing so, uncover the true identity of this universal reptile. The views expressed in this video do not necessarily reflect my own. Now enjoy. Welcome to Florida Baby.
Introducing Dr. Narco Longo. When discussing the dragon as a literal animal, we must first address the innocent, albeit patronizing, criticism that dragons are merely symbolic. It is true that the dragon represents many things to many people, the principle being sexual energy, as best articulated by the Tao. But I would remind such thinkers that the presence of allegory does not negate the reality of the literal or material. The fact that the dove is used to symbolize love and peace does not raise doubt as to the existence of doves. The deer does not cease to exist when perceived as a symbol of fertility. Nor does the snake's association with sexuality negate its existence. Recognizing the dragon to be the creature most associated with allegory, serious consideration must also be given to the phonetic link between the words allegor and alligator. The word alligate means to link things together. Is the very identity of this creature concealed in the concept which it embodies? Nonetheless, I encourage the viewer to never settle for a single interpretation, but to accommodate the literal, the allegorical, the moral, the anagogical, and above all, the astro-theological. According to East Asian mythology, the dragon represents the masculine, and the phoenix represents the feminine. These are the two most prominent animals of not only China, but much of Eurasia. Recognizing the peacock to be the principal inspiration for the Chinese phoenix, we should also expect the Chinese dragon to be present in the animal kingdom. But it is not the Chinese who we must convince, for as we have said, they have historically identified the long or lung with their native alligator. The next criticism which our alligator theory would face is, alligators don't fly. This foolish objection arises from the misconception that dragons have wings. Contrary to what Hollywood would have you believe, the vast majority of the world's dragons were depicted as serpentine, aquatic creatures, typically with four legs. Dragons are consistently associated with rivers, rain, and bodies of water. There is little debate to be had as to the identity of East Asian dragons. They are obviously Chinese alligators, which have undergone the same stylization one would expect amid the transition from realistic to mythological, as in the case of humans to angels or horse to unicorn. As the distribution of these rare animals shrunk, their legend would grow exceedingly in the lands where they were once abundant. Horns and wings have been superimposed onto just about every creature known to man for mythological purposes. Just ask the jackalope, or even Pan. The English word dragon denotes an animal which drags along the ground, not one that flies. Alligators drag along the ground with every step. The English word dragon comes to us from the Greek dracon, meaning serpent-like, nothing to do with wings. And perhaps the last objection, which could be raised against the alligator, is the matter of breathing fire. In the search for a reptile which fits the characteristics of a dragon, man has been forced to accept the breath of fire to have a strictly allegorical meaning. Now, though there is symbolism behind it, 
I can here prove to you exactly how alligators and crocodiles spawned the fire-breathing legend. Around the year 1773, William Bartram depicted an American alligator when visiting the St. John's River of Florida. This depiction wonderfully gives the explanation as to how alligators could breathe fire or have catfish-like whiskers. The caption reads as follows, quote, Bottom figure represents the action of this terrible monster when they bellow in the spring season. They force water out of their throat, which falls from their mouth like a cataract and a steam or vapor from their nostrils like smoke. The top figure represents them rising up out of the water when they devour the fish. Uh, the bellowing is done with their mouth closed and, uh, and so that the noise is forced out through their uh, nostrils and the, uh, the effort of this strain makes their body tremble and a long time ago the Spaniards saw this and thought that the alligators were spitting forth smoke and fire, so they, they were even considered monsters were bellowing uh, fire and were sort of uh, made a good story. This account serves as incredible evidence that the impressions made by the alligator on the European mind are absolutely responsible for the universal traits of dragons. It is true that we find so-called dragons with large wings in the mythology of northern Europe and ancient Mesopotamia, but I shall point out that the vast majority of these creatures do not depict a traditional dragon, but rather a griffin or cockatrice. Animals of this sort have no direct parallel in the animal kingdom for they are astrotheological, composite creatures. The reality is that unlike East Asia, there is no consistent criteria applied to the various Western creatures lumped together under the term dragon. If we take, for example, the so-called dragon goddess Tiamat of ancient Mesopotamia, we find the horns of a bull the claws and mouth of a lion, the legs and tail of an eagle, and the forearms and wings of an angel. This griffinesque deity merely embodies the four fixed signs of the zodiac, Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, and Aquarius. The same astrological makeup can be found in the Sphinx of the Mediterranean, is anybody so foolish to assert that the Sphinx and Dragon are one and the same? Of course not. The same should hold true for the various composite creatures of the world mythologies. When we examine the Red Dragon of Wales with a critical eye, the reality is that he is no dragon at all. He too is merely a localized griffin which has been lumped under the misnomer of dragon. The Welsh dragon bears more in common with the heraldic lion of medieval Europe than he does with the dragons of Asia, Arabia, and America. In truth, there is a strong influence from the wolf and rooster as well. The barbed tail and tongue of the Welsh dragon further displays a departure from the animal kingdom, as the barbed or spaded tail are obvious symbols of the zodiac sign of Scorpio. Ancient Britons did not have alligators or crocodiles available to them with which to recalibrate their various mythological reptiles, as will be discussed shortly. The cockatrice and basilisk which feature a hefty dose of rooster, are separate entities from dragons 
but often fall victim to the misnomer. The Yinglong of East Asia, a creature of similar composition, is one of the few oriental dragons to have flight-worthy wings. But once again, the influence of the eagle and other animals is apparent. Additionally, this creature is an explicitly feminine deity, the ying in its name denoting yin, the feminine, instead of yang, the masculine. This brings to mind the distinction made prior between the winged phoenix as the feminine and the crocodilian dragon as the masculine, which reinforces the idea that wings for flight represent something other than a dragon. Let us now give supporting evidence as to why dragons are in fact crocodilians, not merely symbols. The following comes to us from Tristan Erwin in regards to the St. George legend. Keep in mind the fact that Florida is the only place on earth where both crocodiles and alligators are found. Quote, the mouse fears the cat because it is its prey. So too were our ancestors once prey when humankind faced off against the crocodile for survival. If man was to survive, he had to drink water. Whether it be from a river or lake, the crocodile waited for him. Man did not know which day would be his last, only that death waited for him and that on the day of its choosing, the writhing terror would swallow him and drag him into the abyss. To the average medieval European, a large, man-eating reptile, such as the crocodile, was a dragon. To conceive it as anything else would have been preposterous. Felipe de Theon, in his 12th century bestiary, even states that crocodiles were often misinterpreted as dragons. John Willem describes a dragon behavior in his book, A Display of Heraldry. Quote, the dragons are naturally so hot that they cannot be cooled by drinking of waters, but still gape for the air to refresh them. Willem's description of the cooling habits of dragons matches perfectly that of the crocodile. The crocodile does not sweat, and therefore must pant like a dog, leaving its mouth open to cool itself by allowing heat to escape its body. Such encounters by Europeans with crocodiles validated their legends of dragons, as well as their scientific understanding of the existence of the dragon. To the medieval European, suggesting that a large, man-eating reptile, such as the crocodile, was not a dragon, would be similar to asserting that an owl was not a bird. The crocodile, for as long as it lives, never stops growing and will typically not die of old age. The largest crocodiles in modern times average between 18 and 23 feet, and can weigh as much as 3,000 pounds. Their thick hide is scaly and armor-like. Their bite is the strongest on earth, capable of crushing the bone of elephants with its 5,000-pound bite force. The Nile and saltwater crocodiles are Earth's most deadly beasts. They are apex predators and were the bane of man before the era of human domination. Herodotus states that the creature's scales are impenetrable. Pliny the Elder concurs that its hide is impervious to blows. Even now in the age of firearms, the thickness of the crocodile's hide can be attested to. It often takes multiple bullets to fell a croc. The creature's underbelly is the only spot which can be fatally penetrated by spear or blade. The difficulty a man faces 
to slay a crocodile with primitive weapons is best illustrated by an event in 2015 in the African nation of Uganda, where a man named Mubarak Botak Buza took revenge on a crocodile for swallowing his wife and unborn child. <laughs> <laughs> Mubarak <laughs> Mubarak Butak Booz took revenge on a crocodile for swallowing his wife and unborn child. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> the diff the difficulty a man faces to slay a crocodile with primitive weapons is best illustrated by an event in 2015 in the African nation of Uganda, where a man named Mubarak Butak Buza took revenge on a crocodile. <laughs> took revenge on a crocodile for swallowing his wife and unborn child. Killing the beast also avenged the six other women eaten by the crocodile. The man used a specially made spear the local blacksmith crafted for him to assault the beast. He stabbed at the croc's unarmored flanks while his friends threw stones at the animal. The barbed spear had a rope attached to it so that once the croc's belly had been impaled, the rope was pulled and the creature's belly was ripped open. The killing of this 13 foot, 1300 pound crocodile took over an hour and a half to accomplish. The lengthy struggle displaying the difficulty of killing a crocodile with primitive weapons. Today, in rural Africa, Asia, and America, the crocodile still reigns supreme. Villagers must still draw water from the river, where crocodiles sometimes successfully catch them unaware. It is estimated that thousands are killed by the Nile crocodile in Africa each year. The sad tale is timeless and unchanging. The crocodile lies in wait beneath the murky water watching its prey from below, waiting for the perfect moment to ascend from the depths and pull its victim into the river. With one bite, its victim's body is broken and useless. The victim's resistance is futile. Screaming spectators look on, well aware no help can be given. This sad, familiar tale has been recounted time and time again, from the ancient to the present day. Such events would have been dramatically more numerous in ancient times, before wells and plumbing. All persons would have risked life and limb to gather water from the river, greatly increasing the interaction between humans and crocodiles at water's edge and thus number of deaths inflicted. Crocodiles were scourges wherever they resided. Centuries of culling since gunpowder have whittled down both the species and its typical prey, leading many experts to hypothesize the number of large crocodiles would have been much greater before the age of gunpowder. their maximum size likely being larger as well. The Greek historian Herodotus wrote in the 5th century BC that the larger crocodiles are 17 cubits in length, or 26 feet. 
Isidore of Seville in the 7th century AD believed their size to be 30 feet in length. Guillaume Le Clerc also lists the crocodile at 30 feet in length. In a time before people had the means to kill the biggest and deadliest, crocodiles could grow unchecked. Those more numerous, long-lived specimens must surely have been even more remarkable killing machines than most modern crocodiles are. A man-eating crocodile's propensity for terrorizing humanity has persisted into modern times in some parts of the world. One croc, dubbed Gustav, is claimed to have devoured over 300 victims in Burundi and may still be alive to this day. Between 20 and 25 feet in length, he is easily spotted by the three bullet wounds in his body, and local inhabitants still fear encountering him. The remarkable story of Gustav echoes many stories, centuries, even millennia older. In Libya, in 300 AD, a man-eating reptilian creature of great size preyed on the villagers as they drew water from the river. Its reign of terror was not ended until a Roman soldier, now venerated as St. George, slew the beast. The animal was called a dragon in Europe, while the description of the creature St. George encountered matches that of the Nile crocodile. It therefore is very likely that St. George felled an ancient incarnation of Gustav, and that the legend of St. George and the dragon is one that has its origins in an actual event, the slaying of a Nile crocodile. St. George's Cathedral in Barcelona depicts the famous dragon slayer encountering a dragon that bears much resemblance to a crocodile. Several more tales of dragon slaying that resemble crocodile encounters come from ancient Greece. For example, Heracles confronted and defeated a lake-dwelling dragon, the Hydra of Lerna. The Greek word hydra means water serpent. Cadmus, founder of Thebes, is said to have slain the Ismenian dragon that had been coming forth from the river and devouring unsuspecting victims. It was said to have been the guardian of the sacred spring of Ares. Here again, this dragon is likely to have been a crocodile. In Ethiopia, a land known for crocodiles, the Mycenaean hero Perseus is said to have slain a sea monster, or Cetus, the Greek word meaning a reptilian, fish-like monster with a long snout. Likewise, Troy, located in Anatolia, another region that crocodiles once inhabited, was also plagued by a Cetus. According to the Greek legend, Heracles finally ended that creature's reign of terror. In Rome's war with Carthage, the Roman legion was attacked by a dragon coming forth from the river, according to the Roman Cassius Dio. In Rhodes, a Maltese knight slew a dragon that had been residing in a spring near a cave. The beast was slain by stabbing its weak, unarmored belly. Each of these tales of dragons centers around a hero confronting a dragon that comes forth from the water. Crocodiles may seem a far cry from the Hydra or Cetus of ancient Greek and Roman legend, but the human tendency for exaggeration should not be underestimated. In the 2015 incident discussed earlier, in which a crocodile was killed with a spear by Mubarak Botak Buza, Botak Buza's slang of the crocodile turned him into a national hero. This contemporary event 
shows how quickly a story will spread of the slaying of a man-eating beast, and indeed of how quickly such stories soon stretch the facts. The slain thirteen-foot crocodile grew in size. By the time the story made it to England, the Guardian reported the animal's length as twenty feet and the Daily Mail as 25. Croc tales, dragon tales, and fish tales all demonstrate a storyteller's tendency toward embellishment. The accounts of crocodiles identified as dragons do not end in the ancient era. Marco Polo, in his 13th century travels east, mentions seeing dragons in China. He describes them as ferocious beasts, ten paces in length, living in the river. In the following century, Sir John Mandeville, traveling through Arabia, describes that country as, quote, full of dangerous and great serpents. In Crete, an ancient Minoan tomb, Sealstone, was found depicting two dragons, which appear, in fact, to be crocodiles. In an illuminated manuscript from the 15th century, St. George is depicted as slaying a crocodile. In a manuscript of St. Margaret and the Dragon from 1480, the beast is also a crocodilian dragon. A much more recent example turned up in 1776, when a crocodile wandered into the Spanish town of Ciudad de Mallorca and took up residence in the sewers. Its presence stirred fear and panic among the residents. The crocodile was slain by Bartomeu Koch. Its body is still preserved in the local museum. At the time, even in the 18th century, the creature was referred to as a dragon. The Drac de Na Coca, or in English, the dragon of Mrs. Coke. In similar fashion, the dragon of Melina once plagued the city of Jaén in Spain. Its body was stuffed and mounted for many years in the church of San Idefonso. Likewise, the Colegio del Patriarca in Valencia has a preserved crocodile that plagued its city in the Middle Ages. It is still known today as the Dragon del Patriarca. In Caceres, the church of the Ermita del Cristo has the Dragon of Calcedilla preserved and on display. Outside of Spain, a similar instance occurs in the Czech Republic, in the city of Brun, a very large preserved crocodile hangs above a tunnel in the city. It is said to have dwelled in the river Svratka sometime before the 1500s and to have feasted upon the people of the city. It was known as the dragon of Brun. In Sicily, the embalmed body of a 10-foot crocodile still hangs above Palermo. Local lore has it that the croc hunted the Paparetto River, and preyed on children before finally being slain. Whether these events actually occurred or not is debatable. Some of these crocodiles could just be misremembered trophies brought back from the Orient, but some of these certainly exist. The King of Castile, for example, received the gift of a live crocodile in the 13th century from Egyptian emissaries. Its corpse is still on display. Jan Zajik brought back with him a live crocodile as a trophy from the Holy Land to his castle near Prague in 1522. The crocodile lived out its days in the castle moat 
and was paraded around by Jan on festive occasions, acquiring its name, the Dragon of Boudin. Similar legends occurred in Marseille, Ragusa, Aix, and Lyons. It is of course possible that Nile crocodiles did occasionally cross the Mediterranean. It is no secret that the range of crocodiles was once much larger before the proliferation of firearms in Africa. Previously, the range of the Nile crocodile did push up against the Mediterranean Sea. It is therefore possible that the occasional crocodile ventured into Europe during the Middle Ages. Crocodiles were native to Morocco until 1960. That North African country lies only 8.9 miles from the southern tip of Spain. Crocodiles are noted to be able to travel long distances over water, making crossing the Mediterranean Sea quite possible for the species. Anderson, in his 1898 Zoology of Egypt, states that crocodiles had lived in Sicily in the past. Klaas de Smet has gone as far as theorizing that crocodiles spread as far as Italy, Spain, and southern France. Naturalists Borello, Schmaltz, Palumbo, and countless others all refer to crocodiles having once resided in Sicily, specifically in the now extinct river of Paparetto. Even today the occasional crocodile appears in Italy and Greece and always causes quite the stir. The 2014 appearance of a Nile crocodile on the island of Crete caused an enormous panic for residents and local farmers. Contrary to popular belief, crocodiles are capable of surviving in Europe. They can and do survive in extremely cold temperatures. The crocodile will submerge in water, place its snout above the freezing ice, and hibernate until temperatures rise. Reptile expert Dr. Ian Stephen believes crocodiles could, in fact, survive even the cold of British waters. Europe's climate was also much hotter at the time of these reported crocodile encounters. In fact, it was much warmer than it is today during these periods. The Roman warming period lasted until the 3rd century AD, followed by another warm period between the 9th and 13th centuries, the time period that frames many of the European crocodile encounters previously mentioned. But whether these legends are true or not is secondary to the fact that Europeans considered crocodiles to be dragons. Moreover, their encounters with crocodiles made dragons no mere myth to Europeans, but living, breathing, and deadly creatures." End quote. While most of everything which we have just read about the crocodile would apply to the alligator as well, we may make the distinction that alligators tend to be friendlier than crocodiles. Cookies? Okay. Yeah. Chips Ahoy. Look. Chips Ahoy, your favorite. Chips Ahoy, your favorite. Chips Ahoy, your favorite. Some have gone as far as to say that the Chinese alligator is docile. This explains why Chinese dragons inspired wise benevolent dragon deities, and the Nile crocodile inspired horrific monsters in ancient times. The legend of St. George and the dragon may even be a direct copy of an earlier Egyptian myth in which a mounted Horus tramples and impales a crocodile at his feet. 
although it is likely that both are merely the artistic representations of astrotheological events. Astrologically speaking, all lizards are ruled by the planet Pluto, god of the underworld, known to the Greeks as Hades. The word lizard comes to us from his biblical equivalent, Lazarus, another symbol of the death cycle. It is from the Spanish El Lagarto, meaning lizard, that we get the English alligator. Seeing as how Pluto is the planet which rules over Scorpio, the eighth sign of the zodiac, this would explain the association of Scorpio with crocodilians in ancient times. Scorpio is the sign which rules over death and rebirth, and it is for this reason that Halloween serves as its principal holiday. Other lizards aside, alligators and crocodiles specifically represent the planet Saturn, god of time, misfortune, and crime, among other things. Saturn was known to the Greeks as Kronos, and it is from the Kro prefix that we get the words chronological, chronic, creator, cruel, crime, crook, crock, crack, crap, etc. An undeniable association with time can be observed in the common expressions of see a later alligator and in a while crocodile. The rulership of Saturn over alligators is cemented by the fact that all crocodilians keep their living children inside of their vicious jaws for the sake of transport or protection. This is a direct parallel to the myth of Saturn devouring his own children and would have made a great impression on ancient peoples. The following comes to us from Secret Teachings of All Ages by Manly P. Hall. Crocodiles were regarded by the Egyptians both as symbols of Typhon and emblems of the supreme deity, of the latter because while underwater, the crocodile is capable of seeing, Plutarch asserts, though its eyes are covered by a thin membrane. The Egyptians declared that no matter how far away the crocodile laid its eggs, the Nile would reach up to them in its next inundation. This reptile being endowed with a mysterious sense, capable of making known the extent of the flood months before it took place. There were two kinds of crocodiles. The larger and more ferocious was hated by the Egyptians, for they likened it to the nature of Typhon, their destroying demon. Typhon waited to devour all who failed to pass the judgment of the dead, which right took place in the Hall of Justice between the earth and the Elysian fields. Anthony Todd Thompson thus describes the good treatment accorded the smaller and tamer crocodiles, which the Egyptians accepted as personifications of good. Quote, they were fed daily and occasionally had mulled wine poured down their throats. Their ears were ornamented with rings of gold and precious stones, and their forefeet adorned with bracelets. End quote. Let us here discuss the two species of alligator and how they are different from crocodiles and caimans. We shall read from Britannica, quote, Alligators, like other crocodilians, are large animals with powerful tails that are used both in defense and in swimming. Their eyes, ears, and nostrils are placed on top of their long head and project slightly above the water when the reptiles float at the surface, as they often do. Alligators can be differentiated from true crocodiles by the form of their jaw and teeth. 
Alligators possess a broad, U-shaped snout and have an overbite. That is, all the teeth of the lower jaw fit within or are lingual to the teeth of the upper jaw. The large fourth tooth on each side of the alligator's lower jaw fits into a socket in the upper jaw. Usually, no lower teeth are visible when the mouth is closed. In contrast, true crocodiles have a narrow, V-shaped snout. And the large fourth tooth on each side of the lower jaw projects outside the snout when the mouth is closed. Alligators are carnivorous and live along the edges of permanent bodies of water, such as lakes, swamps, and rivers. They commonly dig burrows in which they rest and avoid weather extremes. The average lifespan of alligators is about 50 years in the wild. However, there have been reports of some specimens living beyond 70 years of age in captivity. The American alligator, the larger of the two species, is found in the southeastern United States. It is black with yellow banding when young and is generally brownish when adult. The maximum length is upwards of 19 feet, but it more typically ranges from 6 to 12 feet. The American alligator has been hunted for its hide, and its young have been sold in large numbers as pets. It disappeared from many areas where it was once abundant and was later given legal protection from hunters until it made an excellent comeback and limited hunting seasons were again established. The adult alligator feeds mainly on fishes, small mammals, and birds, but may sometimes take prey as large as deer or cattle. Members of both sexes hiss, and the males also give loud roars that carry over considerable distances. During the breeding season, the female builds a mound nest of detritus and vegetation in which she buries about 20 to 70 hard-shelled eggs. She guards the eggs and may at this time be dangerous. Members of this species usually avoid humans." End quote. Most of the true Everglades lies within the boundaries of the central and southern Florida Flood Control District. The king of this watery world is the alligator. He's an ugly beast, and many people fear and dislike him because they do not understand him and the unique contributions he makes to the world around him. The alligator is king because he is the one animal that is absolutely essential to the balance of nature to the survival of birds, animals, fish, trees, plants, and all living things in the Everglades. The alligator is the one essential link in this chain of life. This is why the symbol of the flood control district is a gator, Freddy by name. The alligator may be found throughout the state of Florida. He is, however, most numerous in the 18 counties of the Flood Control District. The job of the FCD is to manage the water supply of this area, to control it, to prevent flooding in the wet season, and to store it up for use in the dry season. The FCD gets an important assist from the alligator when it comes to storing water for the dry season. Gators dig holes, which eventually become small ponds storage ponds, which help wildlife survive across periods of extreme drought. You might say that makes the gator something of a water management man. And that's why the FCD people like Freddy. The Everglades is dotted with small tree islands. Many of these islands started around gator holes, dug by gators with mouth, hind feet, and tail. Around these ponds, willows grow then other trees. 
And after many years, an island develops from silt captured by the trees from the southerly flow of Everglades water. Birds live in the trees. Small animals make their homes on these islands. And fish abound in the waters of the gator holes. Wildlife thrives here because there is always a plentiful supply of food. When dry weather sets in, the gator hole becomes a storage pond, a place animals and birds can always turn to to find water. The gator hole at this season is absolutely essential to maintaining the chain of life. The deeper the hole, the greater the chances of preserving the life in this tiny universe. Because he is the only animal who can keep the hole free from silt, the gator is the key then to the balance of nature. The gator keeps the garfish population down. Gars are a constant threat to a favorite freshwater game fish, the bass. Garfish feed on young bass as well as other valuable fishes. Gators feed on garfish. Alligators are good, healthy eaters, but they do not destroy other animals needlessly. The gator is not a threat to man, but he should always be treated warily because of his tremendous strength. Unaggressive and retiring, he will avoid contact with man if possible. But when it comes to garfish, he's got a good appetite. It is not healthy to wander in too close to an alligator's nest. The nest is made of grass, sticks, and mud. The alligator, like other reptiles, is hatched from eggs. In late spring, the female gator lays 40 to 60 eggs. The eggs are hatched by the warmth of a Florida summer and by the heat released from the decomposition of the vegetation used in building the nest. The time it takes the eggs to hatch varies widely depending on such factors as temperature and rainfall. The time is roughly three months, so these eggs will hatch very soon now. After the baby gator breaks open the shell, some energetic wiggling completes the hatching. The baby gators are approximately nine inches long. For several weeks after hatching, the young gators do not have to eat. During this period, they may subsist on the yolk still in their systems. The gator has a trait that is rare in a reptile. She's a good mother. She does not feed the young, but she'll continue to protect them until they are old enough to fend for themselves. They are in danger at this stage of being eaten by wading birds or by any swamp creatures larger than themselves. The young live principally on snails and on whatever else they can catch. Insects, crawfish, frogs, minnows. They are voracious feeders and will snap up just about anything that moves. One of the enemies from whom the mother must protect the young gators is other gators. Bull gators are cannibals and must always be driven away. For the first six years of its life, the gator grows at a rate of about one foot a year. A female seldom exceeds eight feet in length. The bulls may reach 10 feet or longer if they live long enough. The alligator is now on the Department of Interior's list of endangered species. This means the alligator faces possible extinction. Why is the gator endangered? When the young gator reaches a length of four feet, he has no more natural enemies. That is, except for one, the poacher. The hide buyer is always on the lookout for good suppliers. For a good hide, he'll pay the poacher as much as $7 a foot. It is, of course, against the law to kill alligators, but this is a greedy market. A pair of alligator shoes cost $70 to $80. Alligator bags and belts bring high prices. $7 a foot. So poachers slaughter gators at the rate of more than 40000 a year. 
poachers work at night. In the glare of a light, a gator's eyes will glow ruby red. Shoot down the beam and you'll get yourself a gator. Many poachers don't miss, and so the alligator is in danger of extinction. If he goes, the gator holes will fill with silt, and the balance of nature at the tree islands will be destroyed. If he goes, many of the birds will leave the Everglades. If he goes, the fishermen will have to look long and hard to find the largemouth bass out in the Everglades. If he goes, the whole life of the region will change drastically. If the gator could talk, he might point out to us that he has survived since the age of the dinosaurs. He's demonstrated a powerful capacity to endure and to adjust to changes in climate and environment. What he cannot overcome is slaughter. Illegal traffic in hides is destroying the alligator. The Central and Southern Florida Flood Control District and Freddy believe that it is imperative that the alligator survive. The rich and varied life of South Florida depends upon him. The FCD is pledged to provide a supply of good, clean water to Central and South Florida where so many gators live. Please, let's let them live. To the Native Americans of the Southeast United States, the alligator was associated with the idea of rebirth and the cyclical nature of life. It is believed that the alligator, with its ability to shed its skin and emerge anew, represents the natural cycle of birth, growth, death, and rebirth that is present in all living things. Serpent Mound is 1,400 feet long. It's enormous. Alligator Mound, when you put a picture beside it, it looks big too, but it's only like 210 feet long. So it's much smaller. Here's the earliest aerial photograph of the alligator, and it has a very similar topographic context. It's on a hill that juts out into the Raccoon Creek Valley near Newark. So it's on this hill overlooking the, the Raccoon Creek is out here. <coughs> on the top of the hill, sort of looking out over the valley. Um, Serpent Mound, I didn't talk much about the oval, which I interpret as, it, as its eye rather than as an egg in its mouth, but it had a stone altar in the center of that eye or egg on which there was evidence of burning. The altar, and I use that term guardedly, that was attached to the alligator also was sort of a flat stone platform on which there had been intense burning. So lots of similarities between these two things, even though this one's much smaller and uh, doesn't have an eye with the altar. So there are differences, but I think there's remarkable similarities that suggest a connection. So here's what it looks like today. Um, the mound itself was preserved, but there's a road built around it. It's now called, and, and I don't know the Welsh pronunciation, I think it's Bryn D. But when you look at it in the sense, Bryn Du Woods development, and multi-million dollar houses all around it. But the effigy mound is still there. Um, here's the map, and here's what it looks like today. It's near, this is the Raccoon Creek Valley, and here's the Alligator Hill. This map was done by Ephraim Squire and Edwin Davis. That early map of the serpent I showed you was also Ephraim Squire and uh, Edwin Davis. And both of those were published in Ancient Monuments of the Mississippi Valley, which was the very first publication of the Smithsonian Institution in 1848. And that speaks to the importance of Ohio's mounds, not just in the history of Ohio archaeology, but in the history of American science. So this 
problem of who built the mounds isn't just sort of tormenting me, it was uh, tormenting the earliest uh, scientists in America. Next to, or, or nearby the alligator, is the Newark Earthworks, where I have spent much of the last 25 years or more of my career working. And many people argued that because Alligator Mound is near the Newark Earthworks, it must be Hopewell. Just by association, the Newark Earthworks were built by the Hopewell culture sometime between 100 BC and, or probably even narrower than that, sometime around between AD 1 and uh, maybe AD 400. So without any other context other than it's nearby, it's actually about probably five miles away, maybe it's Hopewell. Well, myself and the, some of the same people that worked on the uh, Serpent Mound project decided to go to the alligator. The alligator has been plowed down considerably from what it was originally, um, and perhaps if it wasn't plowed down, it's been trampled a lot by uh, cows that used to live on there. But we decided to go there and excavate a trench into the most intact part of it. Now, actually, the way this started, the left front paw was damaged early on. Uh, Squire and Davis show it there, but shortly after Squire and Davis left, the, the landowner had been mining stone underneath it in the ridge and had undermined the paw, and a bunch of it collapsed, and Squire and Davis got the landowner to stop quarrying stone there. So its front left paw had been truncated. Well, when it became a park, it was donated by the land developer to the uh, Granville Historical Society, no, the Lincoln County Historical Society. <clears throat> then the landowner was sort of building the road around it, the developer was, and was grading off, and actually graded off a little bit more of the paw to sort of smooth the hill. And I visited it shortly after, and there was like a wash of charcoal coming down the hill. Oh. And I went, well, this will be a wonderful opportunity to date it, because you've got maybe a, a charcoal layer. Took samples of it, and the samples came back, I don't remember the exact date, it was a historic date. It was like 1600 or 1700. And what we sort of ended up concluding was that it was so close to the surface, it was subject to contamination. And so we don't really take that, that date seriously, although it could be true. Um, but what we decided was it wasn't going to convince anybody because of its context and because it was from so close to the surface. So we decided and got permission from the Licking County Historical Society to excavate a small trench into its left armpit, which is like the highest part of the mound surviving we could get good context sort of at the bottom and there'd be a lot of earth above it to have insulated it from possible contamination. So this is our trench. Um, here's a profile showing that at one point um, it had been faced with stone, but then earth added onto that. But here we are sort of on the stone facing. We continued our trench beneath that so that it's not a stone mound that was just a stone facing over it. We got deeper, and this was the end of our trench, and came on a small stone mound at the bottom. So we speculate that perhaps it was initially designed by putting a bunch of stone mounds, and these are small stone mounds, about this tall in its entirety. Um, and as we were removing some of the stones here to get our flat profile, we exposed some charcoal, two pretty good sized chunks embedded in the floor. So. If you're not going to find a fire pit, this is about as good a context as you're going to get because it's at the base of the mound, beneath some stones, embedded, compacted in the, the compacted surface of the floor. So we got those two bits of charcoal, sent them to the radiocarbon dating machine, um, and they both came back around AD 1220, plus or minus 50. Again, a four ancient date. We weren't sure of those dates, what those dates might be, so underneath this stone, we took a, a soil sample and sent it to the radiocarbon dating machine to date the organic sediments. Now, this is basically all the dates that the Romaine team got from serpents, that kind of date. Not a charcoal date, but dating on the organic sediments. And we hoped to get some kind of corroboration. That date came back 1,000 AD, 1,005 plus or minus 25. We think this is a much more accurate and precise date. Um, we hope to get it under the stone so that it wouldn't have been contaminated by other organic materials percolating down. But again, I think this just reflects the fact that the mound was built in 1220, 
the sediment used to construct it won't date to 1220, those organic sediments will be older, or in this case, it's younger. Um, no, that's older, that's older, by, by 200 years or so. So, this is the timeline, Hopewell culture, late woodland cultures, and the Fort Ancient culture. These are the radiocarbon dates from Serpent Mound that my team got, those two particles, and these are the dates for Alligator Mound. Now these aren't the only effigy mounds in North America. In the upper Midwest, in Iowa, in Wisconsin, there are hundreds and probably originally thousands of effigy mounds. Bears, birds, all kinds of, even some people effigies. And those all date to sort of late woodland into, well, in southern Ohio, it's the Fort Ancient culture. In uh, the upper Midwest, it has the unimaginative, unimaginative name of the effigy mound culture. So that's the duration of that. So this is really sort of an elegant look at this, that Serpent Mound, Alligator Mound are all built somewhat late in this effigy mound period. And in, in this context, all the effigy mounds in eastern North America were built in that window of time. If Romain's team is right, Serpent Mound was built here. The largest, like most you know, beautifully designed effigy mound in the world. And then there's a thousand years when nobody's building effigy mounds. And then somebody gets the idea again up in the upper Midwest, and then Alligator Mountain is built. Um, that's not impossible. This is the burger figurine found in Illinois. It's probably a, a mythological person. It's this old woman with a stone hoe hoeing the back of one of these serpent monsters. And the serpent's tail back here is turning into a vine of gourds. So clearly there's some rich myth that's represented there. Um, if only we had the stories to go with it. But it shows, again, the, this fundamental importance of serpent monster creatures as part of their, their, their mythology, their cosmology. I just recently read a new book uh, about Picture Cave in Missouri. And this is Mississippian iconography that covers the inside of this cave. And this is a serpent, and initially I guess this has been interpreted as a frog, but the authors of this book think that's this, um, in uh, Caduan or, uh, oral traditions, there's a, a, a mother, an old woman, that mates with the serpent spirit and has offspring, and it's, it's part of this rich myth. And when I saw that painting, I went, J.P. McLean saw Serpent Mound uh, before it was too heavily damaged, before Putnam had excavated it and restored it, and he always thought that there was a frog at the end of the serpent. Uh, but then, of course, he elaborated this bizarre idea that, that the frog was sitting there and the snake was striking at it, and the frog leaped away, ejecting this gigantic egg out um, in fright as it left. And of course, if that's the egg, it's much bigger than the frog itself. But if you take away that silly aspect of the story, those images look pretty interestingly similar. I mean, and one reason why I think that's the eye is because of what's on the other side, like that's the whole head or something. But on the other hand, maybe this is the same kind of iconography, and this is just sort of symbolic, and that stone altar with its fires you know, may have had some deep significance about what was happening in, in this representation of perhaps the same myth. I can't say that. These are widely separated. This is Missouri and this is Ohio. But I find that fascinating. And I highly recommend that book, by the way. It's uh, on, on Picture Cave. And there's beautiful color reproductions of these caves. It's, I think, one of the most important discoveries and windows onto this Mississippian era belief, belief system. Um, it's just fascinating. It's like looking at books of the Paleolithic, Paleolithic cave paintings. This may be one of the most accurate representations of the serpent showing this mound on the other side of the eye, or egg, or whatever. Um, this was done by W.H. Holmes, also by the, in, in, for the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, actually, I'm not sure. I think it was published in Science Magazine. But Holmes was, was working for the Smithsonian then. But it shows that, um, what's his name? Uh, the guy I just mentioned that drew the frog wasn't making up the idea that there was something there. Putnam, when he did his restoration, he was really convinced 
that the serpent was swallowing an egg, and that that iconography tied into oriental myths of serpents swallowing the world egg or something. So I think Putnam sort of believed that in his mind and paid less attention to what was going on out here because it was confusing to his interpretation of this as a serpent and an egg. If it's a serpent eating an egg, what's this? So Putnam didn't restore this, although you can still see this mound as a little triangular wedge when you go there today. It just hasn't been restored. Mississippian era rattlesnake gorgets found mostly in the southeast, but they do crop up in southern Ohio. And this is a, a typical example. It's a, an abstract sensibility, but it does show sort of a serpent's head with a big eye. In this case, it's round with concentric circles. Um, before I saw that sort of glyph of the snake and the, the, the woman, this is how I envisioned, envisioned Serpent Mound's head, with this exaggerated eye. Now, why would they exaggerate the eye so much? Probably um, for beliefs associated with the eye. Serpents don't have eyelids. Their eyes are always open. Um, there were, I think, myths so that serpents would hypnotize their prey before they would strike them. Um, so the eyes are, are sort of a very spiritual thing anyway. So this may be just a, a way of emphasizing that those eyes are you know, pools that allow access to other worlds, other energies or something. But it's clearly abstracted. It's not a very naturalistic rendering of a serpent rattlesnake head. And neither is Serpent Mound's head, a naturalistic representation of serpent, serpent's head, regardless of how you interpret it. And does that look like an alligator to anybody? I've got a theory about that too. Yeah, you have your hand up? No, I just said. Oh. Yeah. Um, but it, I've got a theory about why it's called alligator, even though it doesn't look much like an alligator. For one thing, alligators can't curl their tail like that. And alligators don't have little round heads. Some people think it might be an opossum, and that this sort of fifth limb with a stone altar on it uh, might be a uh, uh, the pouch turned inside out or symbolically. I don't know about that. But I've got my own ideas about what that might represent. These are decorations that are also found on the rims of Fort Ancient uh, pottery, and they're often thought of as salamanders, but when you compare it to what the the effigy mound of, of the alligator, it looks remarkably similar, which of course, this is well dated to that period, so whatever that represents, I think that represents. So what are we talking about here? Putting all these historic era understandings of uh, American Indian cosmology, and especially in the eastern woodlands, but beyond, many of the western tribes have echoes of this too. They think of the cosmos as generalized three layers. In some groups, it's nine layers. In some, it's perhaps even more. But in general, the cosmos is composed of three layers. The upper world, the sky world, the abode of the thunderbirds and, and, and bird spirits. Um, the lower world, let me get to that in a second. I'll save that for last. The middle world, where we live. The island, this island Earth that, that floats either on the back of a, a, a tortoise or perhaps without a tortoise, just is situated in the center of this world ocean that goes underneath us as well. That beneath world is the abode of two principal spirits, the great horned serpent and the underwater panther. These are representations in rock art of the underwater panther. This one's from Ontario. This one's from the Ohio River on the West Virginia side. This is the Piasa in Illinois that uh, Joliet and Marquette saw as they were uh, paddling along the river. And they did a drawing that's not survived. This is a somewhat later drawing based on their descriptions. This is also a petroglyph along the Ohio River that I find fascinating because it has sort of the same representation as, as the alligator. And here the tail is this spiral, this hypnotic spiral perhaps a, a whirlpool. And many of the particularly Ojibwe traditions about the underwater panther is that it had this long tail that it could use to whip up whirlpools and drown the unwary or the impious. There are stories of uh, Native Americans with a trader crossing Lake Erie 
and a storm is building up, and they'll throw a copper kettle over the side as an offering to the underwater panther not to eat them. Um, uh, for me, I've, got, I've always grown up with dogs. It's, it's horrifying. They, they would often offer a dog. They would tie the dog's legs and throw it overboard as an offering to the underwater panther. You know, eat that, eat my dog, don't eat me. Um, but when children, uh, you know, would like end up drowned along the bank, they would say, the underwater panther took them. Or if people drowned and disappeared, they would say, the underwater panther ate them. And you don't, you could only tell in many tribes underwater panther stories during the winter when the water was frozen over. Um, I couldn't tell them in the summertime, in the spring, when the water was available or, or open, because just talking about that spirit would evoke its, its presence. What people were saying that? Um, different people, Ojibwe, Miami, um, I don't know if the Shawnee uh, had, oh, okay. Okay. Had, had particular underwater panthers. The, uh, the underwater panther and the great horned serpent seem to melt. Some people think it's the same spirit, just in different manifestations. Um, but some, some tribes focus more on one and more on the other. Some tribes definitely recognize two separate personalities. Um, at least one of the anthropologists writing about them has this great phrase that they're other than human persons, but they have great power. And, and both the Thunderbirds and the under, underworld uh, beings could be, they could be asked for power, supernatural power. And, and there's one really powerful uh, Ojibwe story of a shaman that went, wanted to seek power from the underwater panther, and he dreamed that he was standing at the shore, and the underwater panther rose up out of the water and said, what do you want? And he said, I want power. And the underwater, said, underwater panther said, I will grant you power, but every time you use it, one of your family will die. I will take one of your family. And he said, okay. <laughs> and he woke up, and his wife laying beside him and died. And he used the power, and his children, one after another, died. And he became corrupted and evil. And some people associate the underwater panther and that underworld with the devil. I mean, the missionaries in particular would say, oh, the upper world is heaven, and this underworld is, is the evil underwater panther. And it's true that in many of these stories, the serpent and the underwater panther are, are beings to be afraid of, and they, they have some malevolence. Um, but on the other hand, they, they, they can be invoked to bring rain for the crops. So they're essential. And I think the, the, the sense of danger is like the, it's an electrical outlet, right? And you tell your kids not to put their fingers in it because it's dangerous. It could kill you. And I think that's maybe the sense in which these, these spirits are dangerous and harmful. If you don't know what you're doing, you can get hurt by trying to access that power that you're, you're not supposed to. This is a, an Ojibwe birch bark scroll showing one of their ceremonies. This is like the entrance to the longhouse. And as they, the, the, the Mide Rewin, through their sort of like the uh, secret society, not really like the Masons, but sort of like it in that you could become initiated in it and then you could rise to higher levels. In one of those levels, um, you encounter these serpent spirits, and then this is the underwater panther, and have to know the right things to say to, to pass that challenge. Um, and in some cases, you then get access to their power. So, horned serpent, underwater panther. This is Winnebago, uh, we call that now, okay, I mean, I'm a Jibwe. Anyway, a, a drawing made by a, a Winnebago chief of the underwater panther. And that pose, I want you to remember that pose, sideways pose, but the human-like face looking straight at you, and then this long tail that curls at the end, and then these jagged spines. Um, the jagged spines almost sort of evoke alligators, but there are no alligators up here in the, the north where these traditions are strong, which is not, of course, to say that the people up here didn't know about alligators. So, if there are no alligators here, why Alligator Mountain? Well, we know the first residents of Granville were there when there were still Indians there. And if they had asked the Indians, what's that mound? And if the Indians had said, that's Mishipeshu, which is the Ojibwe name for underwater panther. And the, the, uh, the settlers are still learning the Indian languages and they're going, Mishipeshu, underwater panther. Panthers don't live in the water. What do you mean? 
if they said, well, that great spirit that lives in water and has the long tail and sometimes eats people? I said, oh, you mean an alligator. Squire and Davis say it doesn't look much like an alligator, but the people around it, that's what they call it, and they insist on it. Well, they would have insisted on it if they felt the indigenous people that they talked to had told them that's what it was. I don't have a diary or a letter that says anything of the sort happened, but it makes a kind of internal sense that people would, it doesn't look anything like an alligator, but if you thought that that's what someone told you it was, and they were the first people here before you, that they should know. So two effigy mounds in Ohio, the great serpent, the alligator, two ruling spirits of the cosmology of the historic um, American Indian uh, cosmology, the, the horned serpent, the underwater panther. That's what I think these are. And in the same way that historic Native Americans built shrines to the underwater panther, there was a couple of boulders up around Lake Erie that the Wyandotte thought would be underwater panther, and they would leave offerings there. This shrine could have been erected and offerings perhaps burned on that stone platform. Um, I think both of these, both the serpent and the alligator, are shrines to these powerful underworld spirits. And those spirits do not seem to be prominent in the art and iconography of those cultures until the Fort Ancient Culture, the Mississippian period. So for me, that's the context in which these mounds fit. The radiocarbon dates we've got on actual charcoal from the mounds support that. Um, the new dates that suggest it is a de mound after all, as was originally thought, to me aren't definitive. Um, because they're not on charcoal, because they're, they cover a wide span, and because they're, uh, well, I made the point not on charcoal, they're, they're on these, this organic sediment. And we don't know what they're dating. Radiocarbon dates are only as good as their context. If you have a fire pit, and you have charcoal in the fire pit, you're dating when the fire burned in that fire pit. If you have a speck of charcoal in the mound, like my team discovered, well, you're dating when that charcoal burned, but the question is, did the burning of that charcoal have anything to do with the construction of that mound? I think I've made an argument of, of how I can connect that to the, to the, uh, the mound, but I have to make an argument. It's not, it's not intrinsically linked to the building of the mound, unless it were on the burned surface at the bottom of the mound, like the charcoal at the bottom of the alligator. So, understanding the context of what you're dating is crucial. Um, and I think in, in both cases, we don't have enough understanding of the context to, to have either radiocarbonate make or break to you know, make, definitively tell us how old the, the effigy is. So we look at other things. Who else is building mounds? The serpent was important to the people that built that gigantic mound. What culture in that spectrum of cultures were serpents important in? And all of those things line up, in my mind, with the Fort Ancient culture in Southern Ohio. They're in, that, they're in that region. The alligator is on sort of the northern edge of the Fort Ancient culture, but the serpent mound is pretty much in the heart of, of the Fort Ancient culture, and it has a Fort Ancient village right next to it. So that's how I interpret these sites, and I think that's the way. The earliest official depictions of American alligators by Europeans resulted from the French colonization of Florida in 1564, as illustrated by René de Laudonnière. These images would be reprinted in 1591 with the following caption. Please note that the word crocodile is used as the word alligator had not yet been popularized. Quote, the Indian's method of killing crocodiles is as follows. On the edge of a river, they erect a small hut, full of holes and slits, where a watchman is stationed so that he is able to see and hear the crocodiles from afar. These creatures, driven by hunger, climb up out of the rivers and crawl about on the islands in search of prey. When they find none, they make such a ghastly noise that it can be heard half a mile away.
At this moment, the watchman calls the hunters who are in readiness. Grasping a pointed tree trunk, ten or twelve feet long, they advance towards the animal, who usually crawls along with open mouth, and when he opens his mouth, they quickly plunge the thinnest part of the pole into it, in such a way that he cannot get it out, because of the roughness and irregularity of the bark. Turning the crocodile over, they then pound and pierce his belly, which is the softest part of his body, with blows from clubs and arrows. The backs of these animals, particularly those of the old ones, are impenetrable, covered as they are with hard scales. Such is the Indian's method of hunting crocodile. These animals trouble them so much that they have to keep a watch against them at night, and sometimes even in the day, as if they were guarding against some dreadful enemy." End quote. It is believed that only 500 years ago, American alligators regularly grew to over 25 feet in length. This is a place on the planet Earth. It has no name because no one is here to name it. This is a time when no one is here. A place and a time claimed by the sun for oasis and thick growth, ringed with an aura of blue tides. This is the quiet jungle land, alive with creatures in a creature paradise. This will one day be called prehistoric. Later, the New World, then Spanish territory, currently Florida. Few of these prehistoric beasts will survive the names and the millennia and carry on the tradition of the tropical paradise. The alligator lived among dinosaurs during the age of reptiles 180 million years ago. Although one of his early ancestors, Phobosuchus, sometimes grew to a length of 40 feet with a six-foot head, he was a relatively small animal in an age referred to as the terrible lizards. As the Mesozoic era passed and other reptilian dinosaurs became herbivorous, the alligator continued to be a flesh eater. This trait, combined with a strong maternal instinct, an absence of predators and amphibious abilities, enabled the alligator to outlive the age of reptiles and thrive in the age of mammals. Millions of years later, when man first made his way into the wilds of Florida, he found this ancient reptile in abundance. The overgrown peninsula must have seemed a place out of time, a wealth of nature, a paradise. 
An early naturalist, William Bartram, explored the southern United States in the late 1700s. While in Florida, he recorded this confrontation with an alligator. Behold him rushing forth from the flags and the reeds, his enormous body swells, his plated tail brandished high floats upon the lake. The waters, like a cataract, descend from his opening jaws. Clouds of smoke issue from his dilated nostrils. The earth trembles with his thunder. While this fearsome creature was not taken lightly, his huge numbers were taken for granted. In the spring of 1844, Edward Anderson, exploring Florida for President John Tyler, mentioned in his diary that he and his men amused themselves by shooting alligators as they ran along the banks of Lake George. Shortly behind these first naturalists came the first builders into Florida, changing the face of the wilds into habitable areas for man. About the time the railroads were clearing the way for the development of South Florida, the tanning of alligator skins began, and the alligator, previously useless to man, took on a dangerous economic value. Alligators dig dens in shallow water and hibernate in these short tunnels during the winter. When droughts occur, these dens will hold water long after the surrounding area has dried up. They become small oases for the wetland animals as well as a refuge for the alligator. In the spring, the alligators emerge and begin mating rituals 180 million years old. The males fight to establish dominance in territories and then mate freely among the polygamous females. The playful courtships are carried on with the aid of 18 communication signals, including six separate vocalizations, a simple but eloquent vocabulary. Ross Allen, a self-taught expert on reptiles, has listened to the alligator all of his life. The bellowing of an alligator is just a tremendous noise that they make with a great deal of effort causing even the water to ripple around them. Uh, and they throw their head back and roar. Uh, it takes six seconds for them to bellow, and it takes so much energy that they only bellow about five to seven times at one, one time without rest. A month after mating, the female begins building her nest. Dr. Archie Carr, graduate research professor at the University of Florida, has studied many of these nests, some of them built on his own property. Well, something that surprised us here was the length of time that it takes an alligator to make uh, a nest. She takes up to three weeks, or well, once uh, two or three days more than three weeks in building these things, putting on just a little bit, crawling across it, <clears throat> going away and pondering the matter for two or three days and coming back and do it some more before finally uh, she considers it ready to receive the eggs. Then she digs a hole in the top and backs up onto it, lays the eggs, puts on more stuff, crawls over it some more, and then goes away. It's at that time that this, this uh, strict guarding regimen is established. And then the recently uh, confirmed reality of the digging out of the um, eggs by the female and the actual carrying of eggs or young down to the water to ensure that the babies get across whatever distance uh, exists between the nest and the, and the side of the water. In 1976, Eugene Meyer, a field biologist from New York University, shot this film footage in the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge. A mother alligator is transporting her newborn from her nest to the water by scooping them up in her mouth. This is the first documentation of this activity, rarely observed by humans. In captivity, however, the mother alligator gets no such chance to care for her young. Each summer, Clyde Hunt, owner of an alligator farm in Bushnell, Florida, opens the nests built by mother alligators in the overgrown areas of his farm.
aggressive maternal behavior of mother alligators is a unique trait among reptiles. Hunt is driving this mother gator from her nest so he can remove the eggs for incubation, where their chances of survival are increased. 86 is considered the optimum temperature to incubate alligator eggs. If you go uh, 88 or 89, you get all male alligators. If you go 83 to 86, you get all female alligators. Be careful that you don't turn the eggs over. You can drown the embryo. Pick them up and put them back down exactly like you pick them up. Some ants already in this nest. They probably would never hatch if I didn't dig them. three dozen. Count them for sure before we put them in the incubator. Have to keep a watchful eye for Mama sometimes. She forgets about her whipping and comes back anyway. They're not all as aggressive she, as she is. She sure thinks a lot of her nest. She's a real good mother. Sixty days after they are laid, the eggs will hatch. Prior to hatching, the infant alligator begins grunting within the egg. With a small egg tooth at the tip of its nose, it is slow at first to break the inside of its shell. But once the outer shell is cracked, it emerges in an instant. With eyes already open, it is alert and active and immediately begins to walk. It drags the cracked shell still attached to its stomach by a fragile pink umbilical cord. The activities of captive alligators are far different from those who live out their lives in the wild. Alligators born in captivity may never see their mother, will never have to fight for food, will never be hunted by raccoons. They will grow into mild-mannered adults with humans playing an essential role in their lives. Even before they are born, their sex will be determined by the temperature at which the eggs are kept during incubation. The wild alligator is far less predictable. In risking the dangers of his habitat, he learns survival and as an adult becomes an able predator. Very early in his life, while still under the protection of his mother, he finds a place within the social order among the other infants, a social standing he will hold for all of his days. But the young alligators suffer a high mortality rate. Only a small percentage survive their first three years. The ecosystem manages this thing in an alarmingly effective way. With just the normal... Uh, predatory influence of great blue herons and whatever else there is, coons and such, uh, have made it so that at any given moment you hardly ever see more than one or two young alligators after she stopped guarding. I think the great blue heron is one of the real uh, tough predators on young alligators. I know it is. Of course, black bass eat them too. Even bullfrogs have been seen to eat them. Everybody eats baby alligators. Growing approximately one foot per year, at the end of four years, the alligator is large enough to prey on all his former predators, including humans. But with their keen senses of smell and hearing, they can detect approaching humans and will avoid them. Right behind their eyes are ears, little flaps that lift up. They can hear well. They can even hear underwater. They can... I called them when they were in the swamp, about six feet under, and I made an alligator call, and they'd come up to see what kind of an alligator I was. Now, you can do that, too. You can just learn to call. You can speak to an alligator. This is the way you say hello. <coughs> alligators have all kinds of sounds. They bellow like bulls. They snort, snap their jaws, blow and hiss, and wiggle their tails to express their feelings. And baby alligators get in trouble. They holler for help for their mother to come rescue them because they, they need help sometimes when predators are eating them. So they sound like this. Ow! 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 
And then when alligators grow up, six feet long, then they're adults. Then they fall in love, and they have a love call. And sometimes they blow bubbles under each other's chin and give the love call like this. I never give that one in a swamp. Right there. Alligators live to be probably 75 years old at the most. They start out as at eight inches long, grow all the way up to 16 feet sometimes. But they've been reported up to 19 feet. They have musk glands right underneath their jaws that do, does more to protect alligators than anything else. See, they emit musk when they're scared or hurt, and this serves as a warning to other alligators of the danger. For example, a long time ago, when I used to go out to a pond to catch a bunch of alligators, I could catch the first one easily, but not the second one. The second one knew about the danger from the musk of the first one. They, the alligators use their body to swim. If they're swimming slower, they paddle with their feet. They're, the feet are partially webbed, so they can swim long. But they won't swim fast. They fold their feet back against their body and use their tail and swim 15 miles an hour. Alligators have an epiglottis in their throat, keeps the water out when they charge forward or their mouth open. Open up, open up, open up wide. Come on. He doesn't want to. He, uh, come on now, little George. I said open up. Open up, I want you to let the sun light in all the way back here. That's it. Back there, you get the sun. The epiglottis keeps the water out when he's swimming with his mouth open. Alligators have short, strong teeth, made to grip with, so they grab something too large to swallow, they can crush it. Now they, alligators always have good teeth because new ones grow in all the time. Replace the old ones. They are a wonderful animal. They can swim 15 miles an hour. They can run on land very fast. By leaping and jumping, they get tremendous speed of a, with a short distance, of course, of 35 miles an hour. And, and so I hope they're here to stay. Alligators are naturally shy of man, except in populated areas where they become accustomed to human presence, especially if humans feed them for amusement. This is when things get dangerous for both alligators and humans. An alligator that is antagonized or fears danger to its nest will seldom think twice about attacking a human. 
But unlike the crocodile, which has been known to attack humans for no apparent reason, alligators are basically not aggressive. Although their attack is sure and swift, it rarely results in death. In the summer of 1976, Ernest Jackman was attacked by an alligator while swimming in a lake behind his home in Donellan, Florida. The following summer, he was attacked again in the same lake. Both times he was severely injured. Both times the alligator released him. It was a real dark night. I always did swim at night. And uh, undoubtedly the alligator couldn't see me. I never did see him before or afterward. And uh, he just grabbed hold of my arm and let go immediately. But there were some pretty deep marks in the arm. Second time was uh, about 100 yards down from here. And uh, that was about 7.30 in the evening. It was plenty late, so I was not uh, apprehensive about any trouble, really. But uh, this was a real large one. It came up either behind me or to one side because I didn't see it at all until uh, I just felt my head being in a vice, and it uh, uh, bit me on the head and the neck like this at the same time. Immediately let go and almost immediately grabbed uh, my arm, my wrist, and uh, took me down under just very briefly, maybe only three or four feet, and let me go. And uh, that was all there was to it. The Florida Game and Freshwater Fish Commission has had a long and involved relationship with the alligator. For many years, the commission has studied the animal's activities and environment. In addition to tagging alligators to trace their movements, they count nests for population estimates, research their physical peculiarities, and relocate nuisance alligators. Tommy Hines is the Game and Fish Commission's biologist in charge of alligator research and works with biologist Dave Dietz. We're measuring growth rates of these hatchlings. We're measuring mortality of the hatchlings. These pods stay, these hatchling pods stay together uh, clear through until uh, next year and perhaps through the second year in some cases. Tag number is 2753. This is a new capture. So we're interested to see what the productivity of these different habitat types are. We're looking at these same parameters in different areas. Snout vents 13.6. Snout vents 13.6. Total is 27.7. Total is 27.7. And we already see differences. They're more successful in, in, in some habitats than they are others, as, as you find any wildlife species. And then we have other size classes uh, that we've tagged previously that we're monitoring growth rates on. Fifteen point four. The weight is 56 grams. Uh, if we know growth rates of the various size classes, if we know nest success, if we know uh, hatchling mortality, if we know the sex ratio, uh, then we can take all these things and plug them into to a uh, computer and predict, hopefully, uh, what will happen if we remove this size class or if we remove this size class or a certain number of this size. And we can look at management alternatives. Almost all the same crest on this. All of It's regenerated to me. Can you say? Yeah. 1900. 1900 grams of weight. Alligator's vulnerable, first of all, because it's big and conspicuous and does eat people's dogs once in a while and has attacked people. It produces big nests that everybody can see and if, you know, if the nests are made anywhere around where there are people, the nests are easy to see. And these, these factors make it uh, both uh, easy to get at in terms of, of destruction exploitation and also create a climate among the unthinking public that makes them actually want to get rid of it. Some of the, the people who live around where there are alligators want the alligators away. If it is a big 
uh, raunchy bull alligator that's eating their dogs and menacing their children, you can sympathize with this. But this is not always the restriction that they put on it. Some people simply want every alligator gone out of the water anywhere near where they are. This is one aspect of its vulnerability, the fact that it has big teeth and is a carnivore and is naturally a predator. This naturally makes a certain percentage of the population its uh, natural enemy. While not totally harmless, the alligator would surely be content to live out his days without any contact with humans. They are private creatures, and the rituals of their lives are simple and constant. They spend long hours in the sun. We resume from Britannica. The Chinese alligator is a much smaller, little-known reptile found in the Yangtze River region of China. It is similar to the larger form, but attains a maximum length of only seven feet, and is blackish with faint yellowish markings. Fewer than 150 Chinese alligators are thought to remain in the wild, and thus the species is considered critically endangered by the IUCN. End quote. In Chinese culture, alligators are sometimes considered symbols of wealth and abundance due to their association with water. They also represent strength and tenacity, aligning with the qualities of successful individuals. In 1869, English diplomat and naturalist Robert Swinhoe saw a Chinese alligator in an exhibit in Shanghai and wrote the following, quote, In February 1869, some Chinese were exhibiting in the native city of Shanghai what they called a dragon which they declared had been dug out of a hole in the province of Shanse. It was a young crocodile, about four feet long, which they kept in tepid water. They made so much money by showing it that they refused to sell it. I cannot, of course, guess its species, but I nevertheless think the fact worth recording, as evidence that a species of this group does occur in China. End quote. The Chinese alligator is one of the most threatened species in China. Inhabiting the ponds, streams, and lakes of the Yangtze River, the country's only crocodilian has come under threat as China's rush to develop pushes it closer to the brink of extinction. Yangzi 呃，还有就是把这个物种作为一个害兽，因为他们认为是一个竞争性的一个物种，什么养的鱼啊，这其他的这些水生生物可能会被这个养殖鳄吃掉。呃，另外呢，可能就是人口增加的越来越多，所以
和这个繁殖中心，那么开始了大量的繁殖工作。那么这个繁殖工作也非常非常成功，嗯，到现在刚开始可能是抓了二百头左右，那么现在已经到了一万头，一万多头。呃，所以人工繁殖技术已经是不存在问题了，但是野外的这个状况仍然是没有太多的这个改变。Xie Yan is one of a small and concerned group who are behind the current push to conserve the remaining Chinese alligators. On visiting the breeding center in Anhui, she joins local staff exploring the edges of the center ponds, looking for alligator nests. Under watchful eyes, staff carefully pick through the nests, looking for the precious eggs. They are collected, marked, and then taken back to the breeding center for incubation. Uh, now the alligators, because the number is too small, the area is too small, so they are marked with IUCN red tags. 呃，列为极度濒危的这个一个物种，嗯，但是我们的目标呢，就是希望最近的五年或者十年能够释放，比如说上千头，呃，家养的人工养的这个鳄鱼到野外，然后经过几年之后，这些个体繁殖，呃，加上他们的这个后代，我们希望，比如说在十年的这个时间，能够把养子鳄从极度濒危。的这个状况，呃，被提升到 IUCN 的这个濒危物种的这个这个等级当中。如果再过二十年，把这个物种，呃，再从濒危等级再下降到这个易危的这个这个水平。所以我我们希望，比如说五十年的这个时间，我们的这个呃扬子鳄能够从极度濒危变成易危的这个物种。如果时间再长的话，变成一个无危的一个物种。Although you should be convinced by now that dragons are indeed alligators, an expected contender in this debate would be the Komodo monitor, whose forked tongue and infectious mouths serve as great evidence of its dragonhood. But when we compare the eyesight of these creatures, the alligator. Comes out on top. In verb form, the Indo-European root word "dracon" means to see clearly. This fact further pins down the crocodilian identity of mythological dragons. It is an established fact that alligators possess incredible vision, both day and night, above water and below water. Both meanings of the word are a match for the alligator. Komodo dragons do not even have night vision. Though the Komodo monitor is capable of swimming, he by no means could have inspired the dragon's association with rivers, rain, and bodies of water. Such are the domain of the alligator. And last but not least, a Mexican mayor married an alligator-like reptile he called Princess Girl, in a centuries-old ancestral ritual that is believed to bring good luck to his tribe. Victor Hugo Sosa, the mayor of San Pedro Huamelula, in the southern Mexican state of Oaxaca, married a seven-year-old caiman. Last Friday, in a ceremony that has occurred in the town for 230 years, to mark a truce between the indigenous Chantal and Huave, according to Sky News, quote, "I accept responsibility because we love each other. That is what is important," Sosa told reporters after the marriage ceremony. "You can't have a marriage without love." I yield to marriage with the princess girl. Before the marriage, the female caiman, native to Central America, was dressed up in colorful garb and paraded from house to house throughout the town, where locals held her and danced. 
The creature was later adorned with a white bridal dress for the marriage ceremony that took place at the town hall. During the ritual that commemorates the union of the two indigenous tribes, the mayor symbolized a Chantal king, and the Cayman represented a Huave princess girl. Reporters snapped photos of Sosa kissing the head of the creature, whose mouth was tied shut, so she did not bite. After the ceremony, townspeople danced with the reptile amid traditional music to celebrate. We are happy because we celebrate the union of two cultures, Sosa said. People are content, end quote. In 1967, its population severely crippled. The alligator, along with the 29 other species of crocodilians, was placed on the endangered species list. The United States successfully encouraged international treaties to ban the sale of alligator hide products. This was the only effective way of protecting the 29 other species of alligators and crocodiles throughout the world. But even with this protection, only the American alligator responded. It revived so well that alligators began to be a nuisance. In the last few years, Game and Fish has received an average of 10,000 nuisance alligator complaints per year. The most common of these complaints is from the appearance of an alligator in the backyard, and frequently that of an alligator gobbling down a family pet, a direct result of amusement feeding. Dr. Roy McDermott is a herpetologist at the University of South Florida and a member of the Endangered Species Advisory Committee. There's no doubt that the large nuisance, so-called nuisance gator, is a problem in urban areas. Uh, part of the difficulty that's come about is uh, people feeding gators in urban areas, throwing marshmallows to and encouraging their association with boat docks and things like that. There certainly needs to be a push to discourage uh, feeding of alligators in urban areas. Uh, this is a major problem. When alligators lose their fear of people, this results in people-alligator conflict, which is the thing we're trying to avoid. The increase in, in, uh, in nuisance calls has been, has been a function of increase in human population. People moving into alligator habitat plus an increase in, in alligator population. Although we can't document with our present techniques exactly how much alligator populations have increased, uh, we're very confident uh, that they've increased uh, quite a bit. When he's in contact with humans, we've got a problem, a very serious management problem, particularly if it's large animals. Now, people will tolerate the smaller size classes, but when you get to 10, 12, and even larger size alligators, very close to humans, uh, he is a potential threat. Uh, probably not that serious, but the potential is still there. There's no question but what under some circumstances that he's a threat. So I, I think the future is relatively bleak for the large alligator in close contact with man, and I think we're going to have to do something to remove that size class out of that, uh, that area. In South Florida particularly, the wetlands have been altered by draining off large areas in creating hundreds of miles of inland waterways. Alligators take naturally to these canals and their contact with humans there is inevitable. But the gators' recovery problems were exacerbated by the recent widespread development of the state. In order to accommodate Florida's huge population growth, the natural environment has been greatly manipulated.
wild habitat and wild country is diminishing in the state. And this is a, um, a sad trend. On the other hand, at the same time, Florida seems to be growing in, in uh, conservation conscience at a tremendous rate also. So what we've got, I think, is a race. And the fact that we've got an Everglades National Park and that we've got the Okefenokee more or less protected up there gives us a good deal of alligator habitat. The question is, is the alligator going to disappear everywhere else along the line? I think the same question can be asked about almost any wild species that, that comes that it is under stress or likely to come under stress with a continued growth because we will have continued growth until we create such chaos and such a shambles as I judge we have almost created down on the southeast coast, that, that uh, it stops uh, because of the mess it's made of itself. I don't think it's hopeless. I think there's a good chance that we can save good big chunks of moderately well-organized natural systems, but certainly it's scary to look at what's been lost in the distant past and right up until today. By 1976, the Commission felt that the alligator population and the nuisance gator complaints had both increased to a dangerous degree. It was proposed that the American alligator be removed from the endangered list and be put on the less critical threatened list and that supervised, highly restricted gator killing could resume. In 1977, the Department of Interior removed the American alligator from the endangered species list, only the second creature to be saved from the danger of extinction. He's pretty good, sir. Yeah. yeah. You can stick your hand down there. Sure. <laughs> Hand me that paddle. I like that. All right. Just, oh, I can, yeah, can you shove it on back? <laughs> but this ecological triumph was overshadowed by the nuisance gator problem. The commission has two clear choices for the method of handling nuisance alligators. One is to find the troublesome alligator and relocate him to an unpopulated area. The other choice is to kill the alligator and sell its hide, a choice which the Game Commission favors. This is sale of alligator hides, Game and Fish Commission number seven. Experienced gator hunters would be licensed and reimbursed through the sale of nuisance gator hides. Game and Fish has established an elaborate tagging system devised to keep track of individual hides from the killing to the tanning. The hunter's compensation is handled through a commission-controlled sale. At the first auction, several hundred hides were sold at a lucrative $18.50 per foot. The Florida alligator was legally, economically important once again. John and Roland Denise have been licensed by the state as hunters. As far as what I get them with, I i got two or three methods here. This is a gigger I use in a pole, and I gig them, and they take the line, and they go out with it, run out about 20 foot, and when he gets tired, I just go pick this jug up, and he's gigging into it. And then I pull him in, and then I got a convincer to make sure that he'll get in the boat with me, and it's this little jewel right here. And when I convince him to get in the boat, he really does it. Sometimes, I use this. This is another convincer. This is a, a little hatchet right here. And just I convince him to get in the boat with this also. But mainly, if it's a real big one, like a 12, 13 foot or something like that, I use this big convincer. And, and he generally always does what I want him to do. I have a noose on a pole over there, and I slip it around his neck. Hopefully, if everything works out right, and just pull him up in it slides down around his neck and then you really got to hang on because that's when the fun begins then you just hold on like that and fight him until you get through until he settles down a little bit and then you pull him in the boat and if everything works out fine we're going to relocate him right here on my premises 
and then we're going to take his coat off. We're going to take his skin. The Denise brothers were licensed because of their experience. Some of it gained when alligator hunting was outlawed. I think the last hides I saw was about $5 a foot. So you can see there's quite a difference in what it is now. Well, we was poaching gators, I guess is what you would say. <laughs> Same place as we do. we're doing it legal now. <laughs> and uh, that was years ago. Everybody else is doing it too, so, you know, how you going to act? different people that had done this before and they just said go to this place and somebody will meet you there and so I did and a man come out and we go to talking about who you know you know so and so he said yeah said, okay well what y'all holding and we'd tell him and he'd go and put money on us and we'd tear out and then, well, I just brought him up to a place and they paid for him and we took off I never did know what those people's names was but um well we're legal now you know and it's take a lot more I guess you could say take more pride in what you're doing and uh, take, you know, better, better care of the hides and everything. But, oh, yeah, well, the only thing the difference is we, we don't shoot them now. We can't shoot them now. And back then, we were shooting. But basically, we got the same tools that we used then that we do now. We're just going to crack him up here a little bit where y'all can kind of see him. I would say he weighs in the neighborhood of about 250 to 300 pounds, and he's approximately 10 foot long. And uh, you can see his foot onto him. He's kind of a big gator there. And uh, I had to hit him more than one time to convince him to get in my boat. Okay. All right, this is how we put the tag in him right after we kill him. And that identifies it as... The tag. Yeah. A legal alligator. Legal alligator according to the state of law. <laughs> Never underestimate the speed of one of these things. That's where a lot of people get in uh, trouble. Uh, and then they, they start laying up along shore and they try to start feeding them. And then the next thing they want to do is get a little bit closer and then they want to start feeding them out the hands. And the alligator, uh, you can't distinguish between the food and the hand that feeds them. And that's when people start getting bit. Of course, if there was no people around, the alligator uh, wouldn't be a problem to anybody. And uh, so it's people's what what has what really caused the alligator problem in more ways than one. Uh, used to be you used to take these alligators out remote areas, turn them loose, just get rid of them. Uh, there's no more remote areas. Uh, of course, like everything else that's in the in the wild, when it comes to nature. Uh, Nature's going to have to take a second seat because people are going to take over. If one's got to give, you know who's going to give. But the Game Commission's solution may have created a few more problems. There are several questions related to ways of dealing with nuisance gators. Uh, I think that, uh, in my opinion, and I think I speak for most of the people on the committee, is that the nuisance alligator, a large animal living in an urban area, is a problem and it, needs, it is something that needs to be addressed. Uh, the Game and Fish Commission has proposed that this be addressed in one manner. I'm not convinced, nor are other people, that this is the proper way to look at it. That is, the, the commissioning or hiring of agents uh, who probably 
or who by specification are uh, experienced with alligators and who probably therefore are old poachers, okay, which is all right if they do the job, but then they, what they do is they contact these people and these people are then hired on a uh, skin, produced skin basis to go out and solve the nuisance gator problem. Well, what this potentially can lead to is that if you get a, you are an agent of the Game and Fish Commission, you get a call that there's a nuisance gator over in such and such a place at such and such a size, will you please go over and solve the problem? You may go over and spend two or three days looking for it and not find it. Right, but you can solve the problem in terms of producing a gator of that size by going out someplace and shooting one and bringing it in. Now, the difficulties of evaluating how effective that program is to control nuisance gators right, is one that I'm very concerned about. For example, how, are you, how is the commission going to, to um, uh, follow up, so to speak, and know that the gator that was brought in is, in fact, the one that's in the area and the one that's causing the problem? Those are the kinds of questions that that come to mind. Uh, the, the relative costs of paying for alligators uh, or alligator hunters, agents, if you like, as compared to Game and Fish Commission people doing it, I don't think has been really evaluated in terms of a, of a cost uh, management basis kind of an analysis. But most of all, the scientists subjected to the sale of the nuisance alligator hides. With this sale, Florida would enhance the most dangerous threat to all species of alligator and crocodile, the commercial hide industry. I think there should be no leather market in the USA. I think it was uncontrolled back when hunting gators was legal. When they began to close regionally, it made the effective protection of the regional uh, laws much more difficult for there to be open seasons in other places for smuggling, uh, poaching and smuggling thrive uh, under this controlled uh, dribbling of hides into a market for various reasons. The skin on the underbelly of an alligator makes beautiful and durable leather. It is, in fact, far more durable than any other leather made. It is also far more costly. The hide of a six-foot alligator will make six pairs of boots, and each pair will retail for several hundred dollars. But the entire hide is not always usable. A six-foot gator has spent five to six years in the wilderness, fighting for food, digging dens, and generally giving his hide a tough beating. From this comes the premise behind alligator farming. Raise a gator in captivity, make sure he lives an easy, well-fed life, and the hides will be long, wide, and beautiful. In 10 years, Clyde Hunt's breeding stock has grown to 1,800 alligators. For Hunt, this farm is the culmination of a lifetime relationship with the alligator, including years of illegal gator hunting. We were going over into Lake County one night hunting, had the airboat behind the car, and we met a game commission vehicle. We met them head on on the road, and we just met and passed, and... I, uh, Rob asked if, if I thought we should continue on our trip or turn out and go back home. I said, well, I don't see any reason to change our plans. Let's go on hunting. We always figure that they're watching us anyway, which they generally were, or we always supposed they were. So we went on hunting. And I had frequently made the remark that there wasn't any six of them guys going to take my clothes off and look for my hides. And that's the way I brought them out. I'd, take my clothes off and wrap the hides around my body and put the clothes back on. Real tough guy, you know. But later on that night, I found out I wasn't quite so tough. There was five of them. <laughs> it didn't even take six to find my hides. But as it worked out, it was a good thing. It did break our habit of alligator hunting and started me on the road to alligator farming. And I wouldn't take anything now for that opportunity, and it would not have occurred had we not been arrested. In 1967, Hunt started out with 25 adult alligators, which he began to breed. I reasoned that if you put them in a natural pond and they didn't know they were in captivity, that they would act like they weren't in captivity, and it proved to be true, because the next year I had three nests, and we hatched uh, better than 90% of the eggs. I feed them chicken and fish, and uh, 
<clears throat> occasionally I'll grind up a cow, but they won't eat it in its whole form because they're not they've never had it in their whole form. They won't know they don't know what to do with a whole animal. These are domestic alligators. They just don't act like wild alligators. I guess maybe their hunting instincts have been dulled. And uh, except for the females during the nesting period, they're not aggressive. They're they're almost pets. I don't think they have enough intelligence to become pets, but they are domesticated. I'd just rather watch them and observe them and enjoy them than to kill one. In fact, I don't know exactly how I'm going to feel when it comes to skinning these I've raised. I think I might have to hire somebody to do it. Nevertheless, that's my ultimate goal is to raise alligators like other people do cattle and harvest them, which means, of course, to slaughter them. The concept of an alligator farm is in a curious position among conservationist thought. On one hand, its success has the potential of totally wiping out local black market poaching. But while the Florida alligator farm is encouraging the survival of local wild alligators, it may be signing the death warrant for the 29 other species of alligators and crocodiles. The increased commercial activity generated by these farms could also raise the international market for hides to an all-time high. This could push all of these species, all of them endangered, to the verge of extinction. And I feel like that, um, that the alligator is going to be harvested to begin with, regardless. Uh, Secondly, he represents a hazard and a threat to a lot of people. Take a South Florida rancher. If an alligator is killing his cave, he's going to kill it. He's going to waste it. Uh, and more importantly, he may drain that piece of wetland that that alligator lives in, which is, is my way of thinking, some of the most critical habitat we have in this state is our wetland. So if we've got another species that will add some value to that section of wetland, because he has some potential monetary value, uh, then perhaps uh, we can slow down that process. Uh, we can prevent that rancher or encourage that rancher to not drain that last little section of marsh that he's got on, on the backside of his place. As it is, the alligator represents a threat to him and to his, his cattle operation. Uh, if the alligator's worth as much as a calf, he won't worry so much about the alligator eating calf. <laughs> We know that there are many species of, many, some species of crocodilians in the world which are in, uh, in a great danger of going extinct. In fact, uh, one whole family of crocodilians, gavials in India, uh, are probably will go extinct in our lifetime. There are other populations in other areas which have been heavily decimated primarily for hides. An increase in the development of a market for alligator products in this country uh, could very well have a detrimental effect on crocodilian species in other parts of the world. And this is, a, this is a great concern. If we're leading, if this country, in terms of conservation practices and whatever, is, is setting uh, the, uh, the, word, the goals or is leading the way for underdeveloped nations, in which we are in many instances, then we, uh, we should make, make damn sure that what we're preaching to other people to do we're doing ourselves. And if, in fact, we are uh, encouraging the development of a hide market in crocodilian species and telling other people not to shoot them, not to kill them because they're diminishing, then there's a, there's a major problem here, uh, if you like, a, a real dichotomy. We're not dependent upon the alligator as a food resource. It's not comparable to situations where, uh, in underdeveloped nations, where people are absolutely dependent upon things, so they go out and hunt them and eat them, or that kind of thing. We're talking about luxury items. And I just don't think this society needs to exploit uh, a natural population for that kind of thing when we have other alternatives. That's my basic, one of my basic disagreements about the alligator management program. It's no different, as I said earlier, than, um, than shooting egrets for pulling out their feathers or shooting ostriches and pulling out their feathers to put on somebody's hat because that's fashion for the day. In recent years, Florida has put the alligator to every conceivable use. There was a time, hundreds of years ago, when a more natural balance existed. Indians lived in Florida then. They lived among nature. Indeed, they were a respectable part of nature. Like us, they killed the alligator. They ate the meat of the alligator's tail. But unlike us, 
They never killed the animal for amusement. They didn't wear its skin as high fashion. In time, the more sophisticated white man arrived in Florida, and with his rifle, he changed everything. But a certain balance still existed. Alligators were killed as never before, but their numbers were large and seemingly inexhaustible. And the wilderness of Florida, like the alligator, was as stubborn as it was exotic. The problems began when more and more people found the peninsula a desirable place to live. They followed the bulldozer everywhere. If a river ran through a usable area, no harm to divert it. If a marsh bordered a livable area, no harm to fill it. If something was in the way, no harm to move it. Civilization had to go somewhere, so it went. We made ourselves at home in the alligator's home, and then we sent him back. We used him, we changed him. Now, if we like, we can kill or save him. But if we remove his natural habitat and raise him in captivity, have we saved him? Can this fattened farm animal be compared to its fierce and self-sufficient ancestors who roamed the Everglades in a time when the Everglades had been? The questions before us must not be underestimated. The survival of a unique and ancient creature is at stake. Shall we give up the wetlands and the wild plants and animals that live there and have lived there for centuries? Are we going to use another animal until it is used up? Or will we leave it alone in its wild environment? The Florida coastline, the rivers and lakes, the wetlands will never be the same without.